Hello everybody and welcome to a new tutorial. In today's video we're going to be manipulating our textures to create a fake chromatic aberration effect to see what you can see on this sphere. So to do this isn't too complicated, we're going to have to you know explain a few things and plug a few things into our materials to get this working properly, including three textures. Now these textures are going to be provided for you in a link in the description so that you can follow along. Obviously if you have your own textures so that you can make your own thing unique then that's cool too. Um, but let's get started. The first thing that we're going to do is head to an empty place for us to work. I'm going to create a material m underscore tutorial underscore chromatic this just so I can keep it separate from the other and control and s while that's highlighted to save that so now we have that kept now we know that we're going to need some textures and I have provided the textures to you in two different formats because I am evil no it's because I can teach you some different things based on the different format so we have two that are PNGs uh, which will just import regularly and we have one which is a U asset which has to be brought in manually so to bring in our regular textures, uh, we just find our folder that we want to have them in and press import and we can just choose them. There they are, cells and simple mask. So once you've downloaded them, find them in the correct folder. Once you've pressed import and you can press open and they'll pop up. We're going to highlight both of these, control S to save them. Now they're kept inside of our project. For the third texture, we have to be sneaky. It's a U asset file. You cannot use the import button for these. They don't show up. But what you can do is manually bring them into your content folder. I want them to be in the same folder as these guys. So I'm going to find one of these, right click, show in Explorer. Oop. And this will bring up the files in our Explorer view here. Now, I know where the other one lives. Let's see, it is in here. So you can find where you've downloaded it to. Uh, and once you've got the T normal asset, control copy, control paste where it needs to go. And because this is a U asset that was made in an older version of Unreal, this will not work with a newer version. You can't go backwards, but because it was made with an older version of Unreal, you can see now it's populated inside of our project and we can control S to save that. Now it's kept inside of this project forever. Mwah. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are first gonna bring in our cells material, uh, our cells texture rather, Double click on the chromatic to open this up. And we're just going to expand this a little bit. And we're just going to click and drag our cells into the material. And we'll do this with the other uh, textures while we're here as well. So we've got a copy of all of them. So we don't have to minimize this back down. Now just move the mask and the normal out of the way. We don't need these yet. We just need our cells. Now before we change anything, uh, with everything not highlighted, so if you've got a texture highlighted in the details, you're going to have the details for the texture. Just click anywhere in the blank space and you'll have the details for the material. We're going to change the blend mode to translucent, the shading model to unlit because we don't want this to have any shadows affected. And two-sided we're going to turn on so that we can see the inside of the material from the other side while we're looking through it because this is translucent. Okay, now, chromatic aberration. Let's see if we can explain this real quick. So it's essentially when we take a an image and we split its channels into different directions. So if you imagine as light goes through a prism, when it comes out the other side, you can see the different wavelengths or the different colors. So as light goes into a prism, it is split and we can see the green, we can see the blue, we can see the red, we can see the yellow, all of them. That is essentially what chromatic aberration is. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna cheat to do this though. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna need three copies of our cells. So control C and V this until we have three of them. And each one of these is gonna essentially be our different channel. We're gonna have one for red, one for green, one for blue. Now, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna get these guys moving. Now to get these things moving, we're gonna be using panner nodes. So we can hold P and we can left click and that will create a panner. And what a panner does is it constantly adds a value to our UV space to move our texture. So if we right click the first one and we say start previewing node and we plug our panner in, nothing happens na, na, na. and the reason nothing happens is because our panel hasn't got anything in the speed if we were to go ahead and give the speed a low value like 0.5 it will start to scroll upwards 
And that's exactly what we want. Whoopee! Now, we don't want these to move upwards. We're going to be using upwards for our distortion. We're going to move these ever so slightly sideways. So we're going to go ahead and set that back to zero. And in as X, we're going to set this to 0 0.05. And it's going to move it ever so slightly sideways. We're going to control C and V this twice more and plug one into each of the other textures. Now, the reason we're doing this is because each one of these is going to have different UV uh, data. So we can't just use one panner for all three. We need one for each. Everybody gets one, apparently. Right, so now that this is happening, what we can do is from the right-hand side, we have these different channel pins. Because we know we're going to use an RG and B, we're going to combine these all together to make a new texture, essentially. We can use any of the RG or B values. It doesn't matter which one you use, because this is black and white. Each one of these values is both RG and B because RG and B together gives you a white value. So what we will do is drag out from the red, for example, and we'll say make float three. And the first one will go into the X, the second will go into the Y, the third will go into the Z. And now if we were to preview this node, oh, it looks exactly the same, but it's slightly more blobby because it's adding more in, no. Right, but this is fine. Um, the reason we can't see anything happening yet is because we haven't actually split our uh, UVs, they're all moving at exactly the same rate and starting at exactly the same point. So what we could do is we can hold a U and left click for a texture coordinate, hold A and left click for an add node, plug the texture coordinate into the A. And now what we can do with this is we can add a value to our UVs to offset them. So we're going to hold two and left click to get us a uh, I can't remember what we call this one. It's like a vector two, a two vector. Yes, that's it. It's a two vector, not a vector two. Uh, if we plug this into the UVs here, because our UVs are, well, it's a U and a V. It is two values. If we add two values, it will add them in, in, in kind. So the X will get added to the U, the Y will get added to the V. So if we say 0.1 in the Y, we'll only add to the Y, plug this into the coordinate here. And now what we should see is we get some color. And the reason we get some color is because we've offset one of the values, in our case, the red. So we can see the red. The blue here is actually made up of both the blue and the green channel. We're getting a cyan color. So if we take this and we add this directly into the third one, you'd think that we'd be able to see the blue, but we can't because now the blue and the red are occupying the same space. So we can see purple because they are combined and we can see the green on its own because the green, which is the middle, is an offset. We don't want them to be in the same place. so. We're going to say negative 0.1 on the third. And now you can see it's moved in the other direction. We can see R, G, and B. We have a fake chromatic aberration. Yay! Little party there. <laughs> now then, we don't want this just like this. We need to add some distortion to this guy. So we're going to break what we've just made. So we just hold Alt and left click on these pins to unpin them on both the texture coordinates and the two vectors. We're going to take the two vectors and plug them into the A's of our ads. So now they are offset. You'll just get some weird funky flashing going on. And the reason this is happening is because they currently don't have any UV data. It's just set to one. Uh, we're going to delete one of the texture coordinates. And from this guy, we need our water normal. So find where you've put the water normal or bring it into the texture into the material now if you haven't already. We'll head off to an empty space and we'll start working. We know we want to move this because I mentioned it earlier. So hold P and left click for the panner. Stick the panner into the UVs. Take our texture coordinate into the coordinate here. And the speed, we're going to set this to 0.1 in the Y. There we are. So we're moving it in a different direction than we're moving our actual texture here. So the distortion is going a different way. Now for our distortion, what we want to do is we want to add this back in. But we don't want to just directly add this back in because it's going to go crazy. Um, what we need is just two channels. Now, the normal map is made up of an RGB, but normally the B is just a base value and isn't really used. We use the R and the G more to determine how to change the angle of light, you know, based on the, the normal data that we have uh, for both the U and the V direction. So we can drag out from the RGB and we can say component mask, and this just gives us an R and a G. We don't need the B. This is fine. We love this. What we're going to do with this now is hold down M and left click for a multiply. We'll plug the mask into the A and the B. If we hold down S and left click, we get a scalar parameter and we'll call this our distortion intense. And we can plug this into the B. 
And whatever value we plug into here now will determine how much distortion is affecting our texture. We're going to set this to a default value of 0.8 to get the exact same as we had in the example at the beginning. And now what we can do with this is before we plug it straight into the add, we want to re-add it to our original texture coordinate. So hold A and left click, and we'll take this and put it into the B. Add our texture coordinate back into the A. And now from this add, we go ahead and we stick this into our panners. So we add, add, and now we don't have an add for the third, but we do have just the panner. Just stick this straight into the coordinate and it will be fine. And now you can see we're getting our nice RGB wiggliness. Yay, isn't it beautiful? Now, obviously, if we were to change the dis distortion amount, as I say, if we change this down to one, if we are, it's, oh, one is obviously more, change this down to point 0.1, <laughs> idiot. We get much less distortion. I was confused then, I thought I put the, the point in, but I know my brain said one. <sighs> and if we say 10, we get even more, it's barely readable there. We get, so we're gonna stick this to point 0.8, because I like where that is. Obviously set this to whatever you want, but I'm gonna show you why we've made it this in a little while. It's a, a scalar parameter. We can change this during runtime, or we can change it at any point in the editor. So, this is our lovely motion stuff. Let's move this guy out of the way so we've got a bit more room. Uh, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and remap this value using a, uh, an LDR, uh, HDR to LDR. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to take our values and remap them into a new range but still give us an intensity for glow. So if you imagine as you start adding values to a glow, um, in fact, we can I can show you this real quick. Let's uh, stop previewing this node. If I hold down three and left click for a constant and I plug this into the emissive color, we're just gonna have black. If we change this to one, we'll get red because one is red, but there's no glow. Glow occurs when we go above a value of one. So if we change the value and we can do it in the red as well, we can say five red and now it starts to glow. Now you can see it just popped a little bit. You couldn't really see it, but you can see it's starting to become more orange. And this is because the way that the the light is reacting, it makes it um, feel like it's actually your eyes auto adaptation. Uh, it's changing the, the shadow around the edge. You can see the shadow changing. So it's, it's uh, not showing us the glow properly, but if we really blow this up real fast, then now we can see it's glowing. Okay. As the value goes over that uh, one value, it starts to glow. If we start adding the others, then eventually what we get is white. And even if we lower some of these values, we're still gonna start getting more of a white color because this is just the way that it works. We're gonna get rid of this, we don't want it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this through a derived HDR from LDR, and this is gonna remap those values and help us keep our colors consistent and accurate to what we actually need. So derive HDR from LDR. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our float three, stick this into the input. So this is the colors that we want. And our HDR intensity multiplier is going to determine how much glow we have. Now, these are very dark images. So we're actually going to hold down S and left click for a scalar parameter. And we'll call this our HDR intensity. And we'll plug this into the intensity multiplier. And we're going to set this to something like, say, 5,000 like so, let's just zoom this back in so we can see him. And we can plug this directly into our emissive color. And you can see we're just getting white because we've not done it all properly yet. It's still not quite there. And the reason it's not quite there is because we don't, we're not using anything for opacity. Uh, we're, we're just using the entire square. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use our mask. And to use our mask, what we're going to do is we're just gonna add in our original distortion, but we'll do that afterwards. Let's let's do the mask first. From the float three, we're gonna drag out and we're gonna say power. And we're just gonna use a power at say point, well, 1.5. And we will multiply, hold M and left click for multiply, A with our mask. And we'll plug this into our opacity. And now you can see, because we're using our mask, we are having a, uh, a limited space. We've cut the tops off and we are lowering the values of our derive. So we're getting this nice color and we're getting this nice wave. Now, 
The tint, we can add in any color, hold V and left click for a vector parameter and we're going to call this our tint color and we can plug this directly into the HDR tint. Nothing happens because it's black, we're not tinting it at all. If we would set this to say something like the light blue in the intro, nothing happens because this is too low of a value. But we have this one saved here, which is the same value, but I put 50, we press OK, you can see it's starting to get a bit bluer. Okay, we're getting some blue in there. If we can go ahead and pump this up even further, you can see we can really blow in that blue. We don't want to blow in all the blue, we want to keep some of that original color. But you can see here it's all being influenced by the tint. We're getting quite a lot of blue in there instead of our RGB values. And we can do this with just about any color. We can say, oh, I fancy it to be green. And now you can see it's tinted green instead. Oh, I, I really like, you know, orangey red. And now it's like an orangey red. And I really like this for things like energy shields. I find that this is uh, a really nice thing to do for shielding. But you might think that this cutoff here is a bit harsh. Yes, I've created a gradient and it is quite smooth, but it still does cut off a little bit harsh, doesn't it? So what we're going to do is add the distortion to our mask. If we right click our mask and we start previewing the node, you can see here it does blend out, but we still just have this big area of dark on both sides and it's a bit obvious. So what we can do is we can hold A to left click for an add and we're essentially just going to do the same thing that we've done here. We're going to take our multiply, stick it in the B, head to our texture coordinates, stick it into the A, and when we add this to the UVs of our mask, our mask will now also be distorted. So now we don't have this nastiness um, that makes it really, really sharp. Uh, we will stop previewing in node. And while it's going to be barely noticeable to most people, you can see that it does make a difference and it looks so much prettier. And there we go. Now we have that working. Let's stick our color back to that nice blue, for example, and just stick it up into a slightly higher color, let's go 200 value to just get that blue. We're going to apply and save. We're going to minimize this down. We're going to create a new sphere. I'll show you how. Right uh, up at the top, we have this little cube with a plus. Click the drop down menu, shapes, cube, and it will place it. Shapes sphere is what we want. <laughs> And that will place the sphere. I, as soon as I said the cube and it popped up, it was like, wait a minute, that's not circle. Dean, you've done it again, you madman. And now we can just drop this onto our shape here and we can get this nice blue coloring. Cool. Now then, the reason that we created our parameters the way that we did earlier is because we can have more control by using a, para a material instance. So we can hover over our material, right click, and we can say create material instance right at the top. And this creates an instance of the material. So if we put this onto our sphere instead, and we open this guy up, he's on the other screen, you can see that we have our options here, our distortion intensity, our HDR intensity, and our tint color. And if we change this, it will change it only for this instance. You can see here, I've got a pink and I've got the original blue. It will only change this instance. If I make another instance, it will only change that instance as well. So I can set this to any color I like, say like a very light green. I can decide that maybe I want this to be a bit brighter. Maybe I want this to be a bit darker. Maybe I want the distortion to be higher. You know, maybe I really want it to be like, wee. maybe I barely want any distortion at all. Maybe I want it to be almost base like that. And this will give you all that control. So there we go. That's how we can create a cool chromatic aberration style effect inside of our materials and then go ahead and tint them, you know, make them wave around, get some control, basically. Hopefully you have learned something today and hopefully you will find some of this useful. Uh, as always, there is a link in the description for my Discord. Uh, this is the third tutorial of coming back, so I'm not ready to reopen the Patreon yet, but I will for, for those of you that prefer to just download the files um, in a few more videos. Um, you can also find a link to my Twitter if you want to follow the madness. Um, I'd say madness. There's no madness. I'm actually really calm, so there you go. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.